Welcome to the Calvary Church Podcast, where we strive to lead people into an overflowing life with Jesus. Join us as we explore inspiring messages, engaging stories, and thought-provoking conversations that uplift your spirit and deepen your faith. Whether you're at home, on the go, or anywhere in between, we're glad you're here. Let's dive in. Oh, you know, we've been walking through this series called Being Versus Doing, and You know, if we were to sit down uh, over tea, I don't like coffee, but over tea and talk about what's your week been like? Uh, For some of you, I know it was crazy hot, insanely hot, makes me want to go to Alaska, Um, but uh, it was hot. But but for some of you, I know this week uh, was chaotic, was stressful, overwhelming, whatever descriptive you might share. And, And if we were to talk about, hey, what are the things you're looking forward to? What? What, what are you anticipating? I'm sure for many of you would come up this thought of a, of a respite, vacation, getaway. Well, uh, what would that look like? How would you describe that? Maybe, maybe for some of you, you'd, you'd describe that as sitting on the beach, listening to the waves crashing, closing your eyes, and just enjoying. For, for others of you, maybe, maybe it's uh, sitting out in a stream or by a river, just fishing. Or, or it might be sitting on your back porch, enjoying just the sounds of nature in a, in a good book, or, or sitting in your garage, listening to your favorite music, working on your old car, or sitting, standing in your workroom, building something for someone you love. Well, what does that look like? And, and I don't know if you've ever wondered this, like, why, why do we reflect in those chaotic, stressful, overwhelming moments? Why do we reflect on times and moments and seasons that are simpler? Is it just because we're overwhelmed? Is it just, is it just because um, we, we've kind of hit the end of our rope and, and we don't have a limit anymore and we're, we're burned out and all of these things we talked about last week and, and, and we just need a, a, a kind of shift. The pendulum needs to swing a little bit. Is that, is that what it is? Or, or, or is it possible Is it possible that maybe, maybe we were created for the simple? Not that we're simple-minded. Maybe we were created for the simple. You know, um, as a pastor... I've uh, experienced this many times. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen in the church. And, and as a pastor leading a church, there are a lot of layers to what I do. And you see this, you know, a message on Sundays, but that's just one small part. I spend hours and hours in the week preparing a message, praying and seeking God, but, but that's just a small part. You know, there's the piece of, of uh, making sure we're connected and engaging with our community and supporting community leaders and changes and, and, and stresses that they go through and being a pastor to them. And there's the idea of finances and, you know, we have buildings and structures and, and, and there's legal implications of all of that. And we want to make sure that we're above grade, that we're doing things in an honorable way, in a legal way. And, and I got to make sure those things are done right. And, and there's, Pastor Michael mentioned sitting with people who are walking through difficult times and just being a listening ear and to be there and pastor people through difficulties. There's all these layers. And, and to be honest with you, there are a number of times, even over the last few years, where I've sat as a pastor and said, why are we doing all of this? Like, it's just so much to keep going. So many things to keep uh, running. You know, it can feel almost like we're, we've got this big machine that we have to just keep operating. And, and in those moments, God's brought me back to something that I want to share with you today that we see uh, evidenced in Luke 10 that we've been walking through this month. It's that in the complications of life, in, in all that we have to do, that, that maybe God needs to bring us back to the simple things, to, to not the numerous things we have to do, but the one thing that we have to do. You know, uh, in, a, in a book, really powerful book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, Author John Mark Comer uh, speaks into this pressure that we have in our culture to be busy, to always be doing. When you ask people, how are you doing? What's the response? It's, I'm doing good and just keeping busy. Like, it's almost like being busy is uh, a badge of honor. And if we're not busy, if we're not overworked, if we're not overwhelmed, are we really trying? Well, John Mark Comer in, in his book, the, uh, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he, he, he uh, sums this up really well. Here's what he said. He said, in our culture, we have become so hurried that we've lost the ability to truly live. Can you leave that on the screen for a second? I want that to sit, set in for a second. This is really powerful. 
in our culture, we have become so hurried that we've lost the ability to truly live. In our busyness, we lose part of our being. This is what we've been talking about, the doing versus being. In our busyness, we lose part of our being. He, he says later, he says, well, when we hurry, we miss out on the beauty and richness of the present moment. Have you ever been there? You're rushing from this thing to the next and you miss the miracles that are happening. You're missing the really good, beautiful things that have happened. Maybe at work, you have worked for months or years on a project and you finally see it come together and it all comes out and it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it's better than you could have imagined. And what do you do? You open your inbox, you start on the next thing and you move on. You never get to embrace the richness of the present moment. This is our life. This is, this is what we do. You see, we've been talking about this month that, that when our identity and worth is defined by what we do, we miss the beauty and the value of who God is shaping us to become. So when, when our being and, and, and our worth is so wrapped up in what we're accomplishing, in the mountains that we're climbing, in the peaks that we're conquering, when it's so wrapped up in that, we miss the beauty of the journey. We miss the beauty of the process. And I know the process can stink sometimes, but there's beauty in the process. If you have kids, look back over your past memories and pictures of your kids at different stages. I promise you in each of those stages, if someone were to ask you, is this moment beautiful? On numerous occasions, you'd say, absolutely not. Do you know what I just had to clean up? Do you know, do you understand that I'm hoarse right now because I've been screaming at the top of my lungs? I, no, we would have never said that in the moment, right? But we look back and we see the beauty of the journey. There's a beauty in the journey that you're on. And when we were so wrapped up in what we're doing, in our busyness, in our hurried attitude, we miss the beauty of what God, God is doing. And, and this is such an important uh, story that we've been walking through. Uh, this month, Luke chapter 10. And it's a story of these two sisters, Mary and Martha. And, and really the, the polar opposite approach they take is Jesus comes into their home as a guest. And we, if you've been with us, we've been reading through uh, this story. And, and we're going to jump back in Luke chapter 10 in verse 38. We're going to read through verse 42. Here's, here's what it says. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So remember, Martha, this sister, she's the one that invites Jesus in as a guest and his disciples, but really the story follows their interaction with Jesus. And, and she welcomes them. She, she opens the door. Verse 39. It says, she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So uh, picture Martha opens the door. Jesus walks in, sits down, just like this. And he begins to teach. He begins to share. This is the son of God, like God in the flesh, and he's speaking with remarkable wisdom, insight, passion, charisma, all of it. And, and Mary finds herself at the feet of Jesus. What's she doing? She's listening. Martha, on the other hand, not what she's doing. Here's what it says, next verse, verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him. She's, she's irritated. You've been there. <laughs> you're, you're cleaning up after dinner. And you walk into the living room and your husband's set back, you know, relaxed, taking a nap. And, and you're like, you've got, you know, mac and cheese on one hand and a two-year-old hanging from the other. And you're like, dude, come on. Do you understand what I'm doing? Let's do this together. This is Martha. Martha is overwhelmed. She, she's got so many things she's trying to do. She wants Jesus to be a welcome guest. And here's what she asks in the uh, second part of verse 40. She said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Do you see what's happening here, Jesus? The lazy one, Mary, is just sitting there like a bump on a log next to you, listening to you. And I'm working my butt off here. I'm exhausted. Do you know what I've had to go through today? Like it's been a tiring day. And now... I walk in the room and you're just sitting there relaxing. Tell her to stop, get up off of her butt and do something for me. Tell her to do some work. Jesus' answer, and this is what we're going to look at today, was not what you would expect. Like in this moment, think about how you would respond. If, if you, know, you had guests 
If you came as a guest to someone's house and, 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 and they're like, tell them to get up and do something. And you'd be like, yeah, go, go, go do something. We'll talk some more later, okay? We've got nothing but time. But that's not what Jesus said. Verse 41, he said, Martha, Martha. I said this a few weeks ago. I always hear Marsha, Marsha, but it's Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. I love how Jesus speaks the truth. Like he wasn't like, stop it. Don't, don't be angry. Don't be upset. He said, you're upset about many things, but here's the deal. Few things are needed, or indeed, only one. So he wasn't in any way diminishing what Martha was feeling. Jesus is a master at empathy, and he, he wasn't demeaning her or putting her down or judging her because she was working hard. He was saying, you are upset, but there's only a few things that you really need. And actually, there's only one that you need. Martha was overwhelmed with her list of things that she needed to get done. She was upset that no one was helping her. She, was, she alone was responsible for everything that needed to happen. And Jesus' response was no way criticizing her work ethic, trying to say, you're a workaholic and get over yourself. He was calling her to something that, she, that he's calling you and I to today. With all of you things you have to do. I know if you look at your phone right now, and you probably just did, um, all the things on your calendar. If you have your task list on your calendar, on your phone, all the things are scrolling through that you just need to check off. In your head, you're thinking of all the things you need to do today before tomorrow. You're thinking of cutting the grass or putting away the laundry or, or, or the work project that you need to do or, or what you need to get ready for work tomorrow and the extra hours you need to put in to just catch up from this past week and, and all these things. And, and Jesus is speaking to you. You're worried about all the things that you have to do, but you've forgotten about what is really needed. And maybe there's only one thing that's really, he's calling us to a life of simplicity. Now, let's be clear. I'm not talking about a life that's easy or a, or a life that has no activity or sense of accomplishment. That's not what, what God is calling us to. You know, in, in, uh, in this book, uh, and our, our author, um, uh, there's a, a lady named, uh, Corey Tenboom, and uh, she wrote the book *The Hiding Place*, and she makes this really powerful statement. Uh, not in *The Hiding Place*, but she makes this statement. She said, "She says this. She said, if the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy." And you know, for some of you, like temptation, and maybe you've grown up in church or you've been raised in a good family, and you know, you haven't done jail time. Um, you weren't selling crack cocaine on the street corners. You, you know, didn't rob a bank. You uh, didn't have a stretch of your life where you, you know, went, went crazy and just started stealing fast cars. Like, you weren't reliving any of those movies or any of those moments. Um, and you're like, I'm a pretty good person. And the draw to do crazy things maybe isn't in you. And what Corey Ten Boom said is so true. If the devil can't make you bad... He makes you busy. Why? Because he pulls you away from the one thing, like the thing that, that Jesus really wants. And, 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 and what can happen as a response to this is sometimes we can think, hey, man, as a follower of Jesus, I should just be so simple. And I should do less. And I should eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. And that's what I'm supposed to do. But God's call to you and I isn't to overcomplicate life. It's not to get lost in the mire of complication. But it is sometimes to do the hard things. It is to do the difficult things. In fact, this is, you know, really evident. We have really important big decisions to make. Like if you're sitting uh, across the table from your spouse or a friend and you're talking through this important decision, do I take this job? Do I move my family across the country? Or do I purchase this big purchase? It's a car or a house or, or an investment. Do, do I do, in those big decisions, it can be so complicated. And regardless of your process to make big decisions, maybe, maybe it's to like put together the pros and cons. Maybe it's to seek wise counsel from people in your life who are, who are, who are wiser than you. Or may, maybe it's you just make gut decisions. So like whatever that process looks like for you, you will always make the best decisions when you uncomplicate, when you simplify the decision. 
That's just a fact of life. It's when you get down to the core of what you're deciding that you'll find yourself making the best, most accurate decisions. And, and, and this, is the, this is the principle. This is a simple truth. It's that complications always bring confusion while simplicity brings clarity. I know it's a dull statement, like, of course. But complications bring confusion where simplicity brings clarity. And in the midst of life, how do we find the clarity that comes from being simple? from simplifying. Jesus called Martha to a place of simplicity. He said there is only one thing that is needed. And he calls us to the same thing. This is what he said in in verse 41 again. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. He boiled all of these things she had to do down to one thing. Jesus did this elsewhere in the Gospels. As, As he was being asked by the religious leaders, what is the greatest commandment? There's over 600 laws in the Jewish law. 600. What's the greatest one? How do you sum up 600 in one? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your uh, being, with all your your mind, spirit, strength, all of it. And And then he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about that last month. How does he do that? He's not eliminating. He's simplifying. And there's a big difference. We will, we will uh, have a better life, a healthier life, a more productive life when we embrace the simplicity of what God, God has called us to do and called us to be. And like I said, simple doesn't mean your schedule is completely clear, that you aren't accomplishing anything significant, but that you know your why. You know your one thing. We see so many great examples of this in history. Uh, one segment of the population that teaches us a lot about living a simple life are monastic societies throughout church history over the last 2,000 years. As monks gather and, and speak into this, the simple. One of the centuries in, the, in church history that we learned the most about living a life that is simpler is the 17th century. In the 17th century, France, uh, with all of its power struggles, debts, constant unrest, Uh, lived numerous spiritual giants whose wisdom we still glean from today. These are men uh, that we look to like Francis de Sales or Blaise Pascal, Madame Guyon, or or Francois Fenelon, who all pursued the inner path of devotion to Jesus that shed so much light on both their world and ours today that we glean from. One of the shining stars in the 17th century, though, was a lay monk. A lay monk who... Uh, wasn't famous at the time so much, but wrote uh, in his journal just incredible nuggets of wisdom. His name was Brother Lawrence. And uh, his conversations and his writings were summed up in a book that's called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's an old, old book. Uh, If you ever get a chance to get a hold of it, it's not an easy book to read. Uh, Remember, it was written in the 17th century, but it's a rich book. And, And and in this book, he, he, he shares these maxims, these kind of words of wisdom for us. And how, how do we walk in simplicity? Not, not, not how do we eliminate more and more from our schedule. Like the, the goal isn't that you just sit on their back porch and read a book all day or you sit by the beach and that's all that you ever do every day. Because that's not real life. God's called us to do difficult things. But how do you find simplicity in the midst of it? And I just want to share a few of these maxims from Brother Lawrence and and unpack them for you in the brief moments we have together. The first one we're going to look at is this. Pause throughout the day to worship God in the depth of your being. Now, I know we worship God in church on Sunday morning. You're like, that's all I need, right? I fill my tank on Sunday morning and I'm ready to go the rest of the week. Um, But that's not what we're called to. Like, that analogy of filling your tank is a cool analogy, but it's not accurate. We're not cars. We don't have tanks, right? The presence of God is something that we should be fostering throughout our day. Pause throughout the day to worship God in the depth of your being. Here's here's the quote from Brother Lawrence. He said, doing our work and other activities, even during our reading and writing, no matter how spiritual, and I emphasize, even during our religious exercises and vocal prayers, we must stop for a moment as often as possible to adore God in the depths of our hearts, to savor him, 
even though on, uh, in passing and stealthily, since you are aware that God is present to you during your actions, that he is in the depths and center of your heart, stop your activities and even your vocal prayers, at least from time to time, to adore him within, to praise him, to ask his help, to offer him your heart and to thank him. How often do we have a rhythm of doing that? That, that maybe, maybe you sit in front of a computer screen all day. Maybe you need to set a reminder on your phone every two hours to get up, to go walk around the office, and just thank God. God, thank you for your presence today. Thank you that you are with me in even the drudgery. Maybe for you, you need to put down your tools and what you're working on. Maybe you need to take a one-minute stroll around the work site and just be aware of the presence of God. How do we simplify our lives? Be aware of what's happening on a broader scale that God is working in you and through you. In Philippians 4, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this in verse 6. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Why is that true? Because when you offer your heart to God, he takes the complications and the stress and the tension, and he begins to ease it. It's a peace that's beyond understanding. Second maxim, roll your actions to be acts of communion with God. Roll your actions to be acts of communion with God, that even in your activity, even in what you're doing to get paid or to take care of your family, see it as communion to God. It's an act of communion to God. Here's the quote. He said, we must continually apply ourselves so that all our actions, without exception, become a kind of brief conversation with God, not in a contrived manner, but coming from the purity and simplicity of our hearts. That we have this ongoing conversation with God. Paul says, pray without ceasing, but he's not saying pray without ceasing. He's saying, continue this conversation with God, even when you're not in church, even when you're not doing something, quote unquote, spiritually uh, inclined. In, in John 15, verse 4, in the ESV version, Jesus said this. He said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abiding in me doesn't mean you sit in a church building or you sit in an altar 24-7, seven days a week. It's that you're walking with a sense of abiding in him. That you have an ongoing conversation. God, help me. I'm going into this presentation. God, God, help me. I have this difficult conversation with my supervisor or with uh, this employee that I have to talk to about their behavior or their, their poor performance. God, God, help me. Help me as I walk into this break room and I know that coworker is going to be there that just brings such stress and anxiety into my heart. God, God, help me. Help me as I go through this day and I have to make some difficult decisions. That you're abiding in him. The next maxim is that the presence of God provides life and nourishment for the soul. What's, what's Brother Lawrence say here? The presence of God provides life and nourishment for the soul. What he's really saying is that the presence of God is more than just a, a, a go-to when you're at the end of your rope. It's for constant upkeep. Uh, it's for what we should do. Here's the quote. He said, the presence of God is then the soul's life and nourishment, which can be acquired by the Lord's grace, that God offers it freely to us. That The presence of God is like oxygen to our lives. How aware of you of the presence of God on a regular, daily basis. In, in uh, Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, I love these statements. It says this, that, that the person, uh, verse, verse 1, uh, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mark mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on the law day and night. Listen to this, verse 3. That person, so verses one and two describe this specific person who's planted by streams of living water in the presence of God. And then verse three tells us what that person does. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Notice 
nothing described there in those verses is what that tree is doing or what it's taking to be healthy. But simply this one thing, it's planted. Where are you planted? What are you abiding in? What are you abiding in? And the last maximum uh, I want to share here is this. Before and after each task, pause briefly to look to God. Before and after each task. Uh, you might not be able to do this in your workplace before a meeting, but before you go into that meeting, pause to look to God. God, guide me. Holy Spirit, lead my words. Give me wisdom in my decisions, in my responses. Here's, here's the quote he said. It would be appropriate for beginners to formulate a few words interiorly, such as, my God, I am completely yours. Or, God of love, I love you with all my heart. Or, Lord, fashion me according to your heart. What, what's he doing there? Brother Lawrence is saying, if you need to, write these down. And if you're not quite sure how to turn to God, there's your starting point. Or, or any other words love spontaneously produces. But they must take care that their, mind, their minds do not wander or return to creatures. The mind must be kept fixed on God alone so that seeing itself so moved and led by the will it will be obliged to remain with God. There's something contagious about being in the presence of God. In Proverbs chapter 16, we read this. To humans belong the plans of the heart, from, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Do we turn to God before we embark on big tasks? Do we turn to God when we're doing what we might call secular work? What you're doing on a daily basis. We should take time to turn to God. So what a challenge this way of life is, especially in today's society. This is such a countercultural approach to life because we're not defined by who we are in our culture, we're defined by what we accomplish and what we do. The accolades aren't going to come because you're a centered person, because you've managed to find your one thing. People won't cheer for you. They'll cheer for you when you're wiped out, exhausted, limping across the finish line, and you've got everything done. But that's not the way that God's called us. It's not what Jesus has called us to. I, I don't know what your schedule looks like on a normal basis, but sometimes when I look over my schedule, uh, the anxiety can build. All the things I have to do, all the decisions I have to make, all the plates I have to keep spinning, and it can become overwhelming. I just look at my week, this coming week, and I look at like, wow, I'm going to be in like a meeting from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. No breaks. I'm just running from one thing to the next. I think, oh man, how am I going to do this? How do I sit with this person? that's walking through hell on earth. And a few minutes later, sit with this person that needs some input on a big decision they're making in their life. And, and then take these next couple hours and write a message. How, how do you do all of that? And, and what you're facing in your schedule is equally overwhelming, I know. How do we get it all done? All the things we, we can get overwhelmed by. How, how do we get it all done, but how do we do it with excellence? And, and in the midst of it all, this is what I process, like, how do I do all of these things and still be a kind person, be a forgiving person, be a compassionate person? How do I get it all done and still be a nice person? How do we, it seems impossible. Like, this is impossible. You're either one or the other. Either you're a jerk that gets everything done. Maybe that's you. Or you're the nicest, kindest person on the face of the earth, but you get nothing done, like all week. Everyone loves you, but you've accomplished nothing. One response to this kind of a situation with a busy schedule, a long list of things to do, daunting decisions to make, one response is to eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. Get it all, like push it all to the side. We're cutting this out. I'm not going to those meetings anymore. I'm telling my boss, I can't do all of this anymore. You put too much on my plate. Maybe that's a conversation you need to have, but 
but, but that's usually our default response. We strip back, we do just what we can do, we, what seems realistic, it seems feasible to us, like this is what I can manage. But as we, as we close today, can I push back for a second on that response? That maybe, maybe that's not the response. Maybe it's not to eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. Not that that's wrong. But God hasn't called us to do the things that are possible, has he? The things that seem achievable, what we might call the low-hanging fruit. Is that what God has called us to? To just do the things that we can do on our own ability, on our own power? That you don't really even need to pray about it. Like, you can do this with your eyes closed. Jesus' disciples didn't do simply what seemed possible but they would do the impossible. They would take the gospel to the ends of the earth, a task that they shouldn't have been able to accomplish. And they didn't do that because they did just what was possible or feasible. They did what was impossible. So when we talk about finding simplicity in life, I'm not talking about cutting your schedule just down to a handful of things that you can manage well. You, you, can, uh, you can ask my wife, Heidi. I don't sit still. It's not like a gift that God gave me. I inherited this from my mother. I, I don't sit still. I don't relax by like doing nothing. I relax by doing things, playing sports, going bike riding. I relax through activity. Maybe you're wired that way too. And, and the idea of eliminate and do nothing, you're like, that sounds like the worst thing you could do to me. Like, hell on earth is doing nothing. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. Maybe, maybe you're wired like that. Maybe Martha, in this story, maybe she was wired like that. Jesus never said that that wiring was wrong or that it was bad. He said this in verse 41 of Luke 10, one more time. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. What is your one thing? Jesus was explaining, you're worried, you're upset. In other words, your emotions are overcoming you because in the midst of your busyness, even good, even good busyness, you've forgotten your one thing. Later in the book of Revelation, Jesus would speak to the churches. He said, you do many good things, but you've forgotten this one thing. You've forsaken your first love. Maybe for you, You've forsaken your first love. You've complicated life and forgot about the simplicity that the way of Jesus calls us to. The simplicity. It's not the elimination of activity. It's the clarity of our activity. And today, I'm not here to tell you to do less. Stop doing stuff. Let's tackle, let's tackle the impossible challenges together. Let's be people willing to face the problems in our businesses in our world, and take them head on. And not just take them head on, but actually overcome them. Because after all, aren't we to be people who overcome? Jesus said that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, right? Let's conquer some things. Not, not just the spiritual things. Let's conquer that budget that no one could figure out. Let's po- conquer that problem in your business or your company that no one else can solve. Let's conquer it. But let's not conquer with more work. Let's not conquer it by putting our head down and just working harder. Let's conquer it about rem- by remembering our one thing, simplifying. Why are we here? After all, we serve a God who overcomes. We serve a God who can do impossible things. But we will never have the fortitude. We will never have the perseverance or the drive to overcome what our world so desperately needs. We'll never be able to bring Jesus to a world that is collapsing without him if we forsake this one thing that is needed, if we forget the one thing. And today, we have this one thing. We have this one calling to commune with Jesus, what Brother Lawrence talks about, to stop, to pause, and to look to God. That in the midst of all we are doing, in the midst of all our busy schedules, the difficult projects and sometimes challenging circumstances that we remember the simplicity of Jesus first, of bringing his presence into our work. Thank you for joining us today on the Calvary Church Podcast. 
We hope you found encouragement and inspiration in today's message. Remember, you are not alone on your faith journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. For more information about our church, upcoming events, and ways to get involved, visit our website at calvaryirwin.com or follow us on social media at Calvary Irwin. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful week.